Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Worship in the Park. My name is James Roland. I'm the pastor at Hope Church here in Storm Lake. And I'd like to invite all of the pastors who are representing their congregations to come on up here real quick so that we can introduce them and uh, recognize these congregations. We have, I believe, five congregations represented here today. So we'll introduce each one of them. And then if you, if you have announcements that need to be made for your congregation, this would be a good time to do that. And then we'll pray and continue our worship. So let's see, how many do we have up here? One, two, three, four, five. Are there any other pastors present who want to come up? I think that's it. All right, as I said, I'm Pastor James Rowland from Hope Church. We are on the west end of town, right next to Faith, Hope, and Charity. And uh, we've been part of the Gospel Fellowship, which is represented here for a number of years. And it is a privilege to be here worshiping with you today. If you want to sit down, you can take, we're just going to take a few minutes. Go ahead and take a seat, and uh, then we'll begin with prayer. So I'm going to pass along now to Pastor Byron Lopez. If you want to introduce yourself, and Leah, you can introduce Buenos dias a todos. Representing BLESS, which is our backpack program. It serves all the communities around in BB County and Cherokee County, so it's going to be August 17th. And last year we gave out 887 bags. 
we plan on doing 900 to 1,000 this year. So uh, if anyone would like to donate or would like to work, I always have my clipboard with me. Um, I do want to say some, one thing. It's been a passion of mine to do this program. And this week I was a little overwhelmed with planning. And I'm just getting out of bed. I'm wide awake. This is not a dream. I was in my the blessed room. I have a, we have a big room at Methodist, at Methodist Church with all of our supplies. And my dad passed away when he was 45 years old. When I was get, going into my bedroom, I said, uh, this vision came to us. It was my dad down in one of our backpacks, sorting out backpacks. And I'm thinking, I'm meant to do this. So please help me.
you've not picked up a bulletin, the lyrics to the songs are in the bulletin. So we've got some guys with these. If you need a bulletin, raise your hand and we'll get you one so you can sing along. The next song is Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Let's praise the Lord and thank these musicians for leading us in music. Can we just praise the Lord and thank you for the Lord with us? I think if you guys, if you want to, you can, oh, you're going to play the piano. We're going to pray. Um, we're going to pray in general. I'll also pray for the offering. And let me just say that um, you are not obligated to give. Um, especially if you are not a member of a church or if you're not a regular attender of a church if you're just walking by today and you heard this music in the park uh, this is not about getting your money uh, there are some people here who regularly practice giving tithes or offerings to the Lord it's an act of worship and it's also a spiritual discipline that helps us to grow in becoming like God in His generosity
generosity toward us. And it, it helps us to find joy in giving. That's one of the reasons why we do it. If you are a member of one of the churches here, or if you'd like to choose that your offering would go to a certain congregation, there are buckets right up here in the front, and each one is labeled with uh, the, label, the name of the different congregations here. So feel free, as they're singing, um, you can just bring your offerings forward to the Lord. The Psalms say, bring your offerings forward with song and dance. So if you want to dance, you're very welcome to, Kaboko, or anyone else. Um, but to do it joyfully, that's the whole point. We're going to pray now and uh, praise the Lord, thank Him, and intercede on behalf of ourselves and others. And uh, to give Him the thanks that is so due. So would you please join me? Our Father in God, our Maker, our Sustainer, the great artist of this universe, King, Master, Lord, and Lover, we come before you with gratefulness. You've made this such a beautiful day, and you welcomed us into your creation. Father, we're grateful to be here together. Each one of us are recognizing we don't have any right to come before you. Though you made us and we are your children, we have rebelled. And we have lived more for our own lives, our own selves, than we have lived for you. And yet in your great mercy, you've never stopped loving us. And that even today, both on the righteous and the wicked, on everyone you cause your son Father, you sent your Son into this world to save us from our sins by going to the cross and shedding his blood. That whoever would recognize him as their Savior and Lord, that you would turn, not give us what we deserve, but give us what we don't deserve. Your grace and forgiveness. So we thank you for this. We praise you.
this church to become truly a church universal, made up of all people, tribes, tongues, nations, that from all over the world we would be united for one purpose and one voice to the praise of your Son who is risen, crucified and risen from the dead to raise up all who are called by his name, Jesus Christ. And all these things together we pray in his name and all the people said,
talk a little bit more about the rallying statements of the Gospel Fellowship. And in your bulletin at the very beginning, it talks about three distinct uh, rallying statements or tenets. And uh, this morning, I will just address Revelation. And you may be thinking, is he going to talk about the book of Revelation? No, this is the revelation of God's word to us, the Holy Bible. And I decided to look up a few statistics to help you understand. According to Wycliffe translators, there are roughly 7,400 languages. And as of right now, 3,478 languages still have no scripture. They don't have the word of God. And they call those countries or those people groups that they are in Bible poverty. That's something. Well, you and I know that we don't endure any Bible poverty, at least most of us here in the United States or here in Storm Lake. Matter of fact, I could almost wager if I was a bet man that you could have four to five to six Bibles in your house. Some of them maybe even a bit dusty, right? All kinds of the Word of God is in our lives and in our homes. And I'm so grateful that we live in a country where we have access to God's Word freely. We aren't persecuted if we read it, which a number of countries are dealing with that. And so as I talk this morning about the revelation, just have a thankful and, grad and a heart full of gratitude that we have such an amazing accessibility to God's Word, which is huge, absolutely huge for us as Christians, that we can spend time with the Word of God. So according to the statement of Revelation, God has graciously disclosed his existence and power in the created order and has supremely revealed himself to fallen human beings in the person of his son, the incarnate word. Moreover, this God is a speaking God and by his spirit has graciously disclosed himself in human words. We believe that God has inspired the words preserved in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, which are both record and means of his saving work in the world. These writings alone constitute the verbally inspired word of God, utterly authoritative and without error in the original writings, complete in its revelation of his will for salvation, sufficient for all that God requires us to believe in and final in its authority over every domain of knowledge to which it speaks. For some among us, we recognize the Bible to include 66 books. For others among us, we recognize the Bible to include, include 73 books. We all agree to bear with one another by teaching and preaching during gospel fellowship events. From the 66 books, which we all agree are the inspired and, our, and authoritative Word of God, we confess that both our finitude and our sinfulness preclude the possibility of knowing God's truth exhaustively. But we affirm that, enlightened by the Spirit of God, we can know God's revealed truth truly. The Bible is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it teaches, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, and trusted as God's pledge in all that it promises. As God's people hear, believe, and do the word, they are equipped as disciples of Christ and witnesses to the gospel. Glory be to the Lord.
preach with a hat on like this, but my wife said that my bald head would ricochet sunlight onto you and that you might be blinded in the middle of the sermon. And so I just want you to know that we're thinking about you. We're considering your needs this morning. You are on our mind. But you know who else has you on their mind? Jesus. You are very important to him. I'm going to read a passage of scripture that maybe you have in your own copy of God's word. If you do have it or your phone, bring it out. I want you to look at this passage too. It's Ephesians chapter 3.
maybe about 10 or 15,000. I don't know what the number is, but I just know that I'm using them all up up here. So I may be silent for the rest of the day, but imagine of all the words that you use in your day, 5% of them was solid, you talking to God. I want to stress to you this morning that prayer is not just essential for Paul, it is essential for you. You need prayer. Eight times, Paul specifically asked in his letters other people to pray for him. Now, I want you to imagine yourself asking someone else to pray for you right now. Why do you think prayer was so crucial for Paul? The simple answer is that Paul gets it from Jesus being a disciple of Jesus. Jesus bathed everything he did in prayer. All of the Gospels mention him praying with 25 specific prayers, detailed teaching on how to pray, like Luke chapter 11. And often it's assumed that when Jesus retreated to quiet, desolate places, he did so to recharge and commune with his Father, which is exactly what prayer is supposed to be. Now, it says in Hebrews that he ever lives to intercede for you. That means that he is constantly in prayer. But if I were honest this morning, and I'm going to try to be because I have the microphone, and if you were honest, I wonder if you would consider prayer. I think if I was honest, I would say to you that prayer isn't that important to me most of the time. At least not like it is for Paul or Jesus. And it can be for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's just like what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, where prayer isn't something that I go to because I don't know how to pray. Scripture says that that's going to come. That happens at times. But other times, I'm going to confess, and you need to hear this from a pastor because I think it can help you, is that sometimes I find prayer boring. I find it compulsory. I find it a ritual that I've been taught to do, but it's the last thing I want to do. My reasons for that are that there's something about me that's off. But when I hear Paul pray, I don't hear any of those negative associations. None of those. I don't feel like when I read this passage today, there's nothing boring about prayer for Paul. There is nothing ritualistic about prayer for Paul, really. And if it's compulsory, it's driven by a joy. Not guilt. Maybe it's because I don't feel a desperation to talk to God. I felt it in the past. I need to go back to AA and hit rock bottom before I treat prayer the way that I should and experience the way it's meant to be. I haven't actually been to prayer. It was a metaphor. I've been to AA. It's a metaphor. But possibly, I also need to reimagine in some sense of simplicity what prayer actually is. You see, prayer is nothing more than really talking to God to encounter God. That's sometimes the problem. I don't actually encounter God when I pray. I'm just talking to the ether. I don't really think that there's anybody listening, but I'm doing my due diligence. See, prayer is meant to be relational. And as humans, it includes a lot of asking God for things like wisdom or 
knowledge or information or direction or power or understanding or how to be patient and steadfast or how to have my material and emotional needs met. I need to ask God for things daily like these and more, but I also don't only need to be asking, I need to be asking others to be asking on my behalf. I need to be asking other people to pray for me. And you need to be asking other people to pray for you. And there's a whole bunch of people in this park right now whose job is to be shepherds. But I want to tell you that the most important thing that they do at any time during the week is pray and pray for you. Which begs the question, do they know how? Have you told them how to pray for you? Nothing is more crucial in a minister's role than to lift up your needs in prayer. They need to pray for you and you need to let them know how to do it. Scripture describes the beauty of prayer for each other as a beautiful and vital part of God's design to lead us all into deeper connection to God. And here in Ephesians, Paul commands that we should pray for others and that others should pray for us. That's a few pages later in chapter 6. Or James, not Pastor James, but the author, Jesus' brother, half-brother James, says that the fervent prayer of a righteous person does much. How would they know how to do it unless you tell them what you need? If you have your Bibles, you can notice in the text that Paul describes his posture in prayer as bowing the knee. More usual posture for Jews to pray was to stand like I am now. But this body posture signifies reverence and submission to God. It reminds us of what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 45, where bowing the knee was a sign of honor to the king of the universe. But Paul bows his knee before the Father. When you pray, you approach a king, but you also approach an intimate father. As part of his family, he seeks your good, despite what earthly dads you may know who have failed like myself. This father knows what you need and wants to lovingly lavish you with every good gift. He is powerful. He will respond to your prayers and the prayers of those who pray for you. He even answers the prayers of lowly pastors like Paul. Prayer reminds us of the connection that we have with the whole family of God. The Father has developed a whole family in heaven and on earth, which includes people of God in the past and in the present. It includes the angels that are part of his and all of us are adopted into a family together to give Him glory. But for our purposes here, you are part of the family of God if you know Jesus Christ. And God, as our Father, has given each of us an appropriate role in family life. So that we have wisdom and 
of our personal consciousness and our moral being derives from. It is the inner self, the Old Testament describes it as the heart, where we are captivated in our imagination. like this.
love birds. Not literal birds. People in love. One's named Chuck. The other's named Maria. We got Chuck and Maria here. And Chuck and Maria are newlyweds. And after a long week of work, Chuck and Maria get to take a long walk in the park up along the lake shore. They get to spend some time together. Doesn't that sound nice? Chuck turns to Maria and says, I love you. I really do. What does Chuck mean right there? In our world, Chuck might mean nothing more than this feeling of testosterone in his lower extremities. And he wants to act on that. Maybe that's all that he means by I love you. Maybe we might assume a little bit more about Chuck and that, that there's a little more degree of politeness and decorum to him. And so maybe he means a little bit more than that. And he might mean, Maria, I love you, I really do. Your smile hits me like a harpoon. Your beautiful eyes and the scent of your hair, everything about you hypnotizes me. Therefore, I love you. Sounds nice. In response, Maria turns to Chuck and says, in a kind, similar statement, she can also express how Chuck transfixes her with his kind eyes. halitosis, for those of you who don't know the term, your horrendous breath, would embarrass a feces-stained herd of hippopotamuses. Your bulbous nose makes you look like it came straight out of a cartoon. Your greasy hair looks like it has enough oil to lubricate an engine. And your personality would make Joseph Stalin look empathetic. But... I love you. Now remember that God comes to us and he says, I love you. What does he mean? Does he mean that you mean everything to me? I can't live without you. Your personality, wit, beauty, and everything about you mesmerizes me. Frankly, heaven would be boring if you weren't there. might say that, but they treat the relationship with God this way, and they think that pretty much they are wonderful, and because they're wonderful, God loves them. In a, in a, a phrase, they think that they are lovely, and therefore God loves them. But that's not the, the, the painting that Scripture paints. It paints one that's where God says, I love you. And then he says, morally speaking, you are people of halitosis or bad breath. Morally, you have the bulbous nose and the greasy hair and the abominable personality. Your sins have made you ugly. But I love you anyway because it is in my nature to love. That's what I am like. I don't love you because...
because of you. I love you because I can't help myself. That's me. I am love. And my love is so affectionate and so endearing and so powerful that when I set my affection on you, my love changes you. My love transforms you. You are mine and I will make you like my son. And nothing in all of creation can separate you from him. That is the love that Paul wants you and I to know and explore for the rest of our lives. He talks about it in verse 18 as having four dimensions. And I know we live in a three-dimensional world, but that's part of the point. It's outside, so vast it goes beyond normal existence. It's an expression not meant to be taken the way that a builder or a contractor thinks of a building or a room or how a mathematician thinks of geometric design. These four dimensions of love are meant, not meant to be taken literally, but instead as a unity to show that God's love is so immense it goes beyond our typical way of thinking. The magnitude of how much God loves you is incredible. It pervades your very existence down to the core. If you're paying attention, you can see it. You can feel it. You can taste it. You can touch it. You can smell it. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says that we are to God a pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. John 1.14, we have seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Psalm 85 verse 8, let me hear what the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people. And James 4.8 says that you can draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You can experience God's love because of Christ. And Paul wants believers to understand that God's love is meant to be experienced as Christ dwells in us. He compares the comprehension of these four dimensions to a surpassing knowledge. A knowledge that goes beyond theory or what you might read in a book or even what you read in the Bible. See, the Bible is not this paper pope that is your end all be all. It is access to the divine. It is a means to an end. It is supposed to lead you to Christ. So when you read it, don't check the box. Wonder, have I experienced the author? It's not some specialized knowledge for just a few elites. It's not for those who are just enlightened. Paul wants all believers to genuinely have this insight. You don't need to go to Sedona and go on some sort of spiritualized retreat. He wants you to understand that this matters practically every day and to have God without limits working in you. The manifestation of his fullness. love by some sort of mental exercise. It's meant to be something we put into practice. The implication is that we cannot be spiritually mature as we should be unless God empowers us to grasp the limits, the limitless rather, dimensions of God's love in Christ Jesus. And therefore, you and I should be praying daily for this empowerment to experience the fullness of Christ that we have already possessed by the Spirit. See, God has limitless power. We come to the end of Paul's prayer in this little thing called the doxology. It's an expression of glory to God. The famous English priest and scholar Armitage Robinson once said about this verse, no prayer has ever been framed and has been uttered a bolder request than this. 
Now to him who is able to do far more than we ask or imagine. We pray to a God who is able to buy this great power that we have come to experience. And we ask with hope in the one who has done great deeds for his people in the past. And because we know there's no limit to what he can do, all we ask or imagine is on the table. So, my attitude is not too hard for him to change. My suffering is not too difficult for him to bear with me. My infirmity and pain is not too sharp for him. There's no limit to what he can do. Because he always has great potential. And he sees great potential in us. We ask with his glory in mind. We ask God to act and shine his radiance on us and in this world. We want our prayers to actively acknowledge what is true of him from all eternity, that he is great and majestic and holy and there is none like him. And we want his glory, the glory of Christ, to be in us. Did you notice? He says, now to him who is able to do more than we ask or imagine, through the power that is at work in us. We don't come to him and say, Jesus, take the wheel. In the famous words of Carrie Underwood. And now you do all the work. No. We come to him and say, do more than you ask or imagine through us. In other words, if we want to experience the full love of God, I've got to put it into practice. I don't know about you, but I've never learned anything in life without practice. And I practice to get better at things. I might have a good intention, but if I don't practice, I'll never get to a status of improvement. And so we say this, along with Paul, that we want the glory of Christ to shine through us and the generations of people who come after us. This we say along with Paul, Amen. Which means not simply a matter of lip service, but of a spontaneous response of the people of God for spiritual strength to be grounded by God's love, to remember no matter what, God has no limits. And this is what it means to be part of the family of God. God's family needs prayer for spiritual strength and to understand how to be grounded in his love and empowered by his immensity. To be filled to the full measure of God's fullness is like filling a thimble to its brim with water out of the lake. But the lake is not fully in the thimble since the thimble is full of water. And yet as the thimble is in the lake, it does not diminish the lake. The thimble has the fullness of the lake in the sense that it contains every ingredient that makes up the lake and all the essential characteristics of the lake are in that thimble. We need to pray that we are filled not just with a lake, but an ocean of God's love. That we are immersed in it. That we would come to know this love. All right. Sermon over. It's time for application. I want you to do something for me. We've talked a lot about prayer. And we've talked a lot about love. I might ask you to stand up right now. Would you do that? I know you're getting nervous. What's he going to ask? Some of you are like, I'm not moving. I won't do what he asks. But I ask you to have grace and patience with me. I want you to go to someone else nearby you. And don't be easy on yourself. If you have a spouse or a loved one, choose somebody else. 
I want you to find them and tell them this. And you do this based on Christ's authority, not on your own. So if this feels weird, remember that you are choosing to speak Jesus' words to them. I want you to go to them and say, God loves you. And because God loves you, I love you in Christ. And I want to pray for you and ask them, is there anything that I could pray for you right now? And that's all. Now notice, somebody might come up to you and ask you that question. What do you think you're going to do when they ask you that? you got to be honest and tell them. Whatever it is. Okay? This matters. This is not just a perfunctory exercise. It's not compulsory, although I'm, some of you are looking like, this is not what I came out here to do. But this is where practice helps. Find someone, tell them, God loves you, I love you, I want to pray for you. Go. Tim.
Township, we also serve our uh, Memphis Manor with chapel services and uh, a variety of things we do together. We meet once a month, we have a meal and pray together. And so if you'd like to know more about us, I think I have some brochures in our cardboard box somewhere I think on the table down here. We have three rallying statements and the statement about Revelation was one of them. We have two others. If you'd like to know more, the, uh, our Facebook page is printed on your bulletin.